obviously when you evolve inside an animal body localized in space and time, you get a hellacious set of reflexes and muscles designed to deal with immediate threat in the environment. But at the core of the oyster is, you know, this portal into universalism, which we have denigrated to what we call the imagination. Uh, it, it is a, it is, there is a third eye. The third eye exists, but it doesn't look out at this world. You've got two perfectly good eyes for doing that. The third eye looks out at the holographic matrix of informational totality. And then the problem for that form of perception is um, filtering. Would you say that another word is the word? Well, Atman means soul or being or, yes. I mean, it's simply that consciousness is distributed and holographic, and nobody has their brand on it. What we have been calling human consciousness is the only consciousness there is. Uh, it's something you tap into, not something you evolve out of yourself. I mean, you, you require a local language to create a local model of this universal input. If your local language is insufficient, then you abide in a, in a domain of intuition. And I would, that's what I would call animal consciousness. It's a domain of intuition of, of being. Animals intuit being. But given a more advanced nervous system, a more advanced cultural toolkit, uh, the intuition changes into a, a direct perception and you begin to make poetry and experience loss and feel love and, and it, you begin to feel the emotional outlines of the enterprise of being and how far one can go into that. Uh, I assume it's infinite or at least appears infinite from our limited so position. So so the local language is? Well, the local language is, is a necessary compromise. Uh, it would be, in, it's interesting, uh, the thing that makes psychedelics so central to a discussion like this is they are the only thing which pulls the plug on the illusion, the illusion created by local language. That's why people are both in love with it and terrified of it because it addresses a fundamental aspect of reality and it addresses it incontrovertibly. And people who feel culture as a safety zone that is keeping at bay the black oceans of God knows what are not interested in taking psychedelics. On the other hand, people who feel confined by the cultural dream and who want to cross the black oceans of who knows what to see what's on the other side, they embrace that same experience as a God-sent gift. But it's the same phenomenon. So it, it, it addresses, you know, one's own fundamental relationship uh, to the unknown. Local languages, like local cultures and architectural styles and everything else, are designed to create, I think, uh, an, a, a, an infantile sense of security. One of the bees up my rear end these days is the idea that culture is not uh, our friend, that we have been very naive about uh, about what culture is and how it is something designed for the convenience of the species. And, you know, it could turn you into a janitor or a banker or a, a celebrity or anything else with no interest or concern for whether that's good for you. 
uh, it plays with individuals. And, uh, you know, most people think, or at least here I think most people think, that when you get to be, I don't know, 30, 35, 40 or something, you have jumped all the hurdles. You got your college degree, you had some children, you made some money, you lost some money, maybe you had a marriage, maybe you had several. And anyway, people sort of get the feeling, well, I'm, I'm, I've done it. Actually, the major adventure still lies ahead. And the major adventure is to claim your authentic, true being, which is not culturally given to you. The culture will not explain to you how to be a real human being. It will tell you how to be banker, politician, Indian chief, masseuse, actress, whatever, but it will not give you true being. And uh, maybe this is the voice of somebody who just turned 50 talking, but uh, I thought it would get simpler. It doesn't, because this rejection of culture thing uh, is, uh, is the last and hardest step to take. And there are all kinds of impediments to taking it. The fact that in middle age, if you've played the game right, you get a lot of money. That's totally stultifying in most cases in terms of going forward to the next level. It's almost as though culture is an enterprise self-organized to buy you off at the moment when you might be most dangerous to its values and goals. To humanity trying to reach harmony. Well, you know, in, in Revelation, the, the Ancient of Days is described as uh, there's a, a, a sword which comes out of the mouth. It's a very hard image to picture, but a sword, a turning sword which comes out of the mouth. Uh, and of course, the whole Western myth of creation is a, the world was made by an utterance. In principio, at verbum, at verbo caro factum est. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. And in some sense, I think the the what is not stated there is that then out of the flesh the word must be redistilled. That's the second half of the historical process. Uh, in this book, which I may mention at some point, uh, the statement is made, God created man in order to taste the bitter fruit of time. Uh, in the DMT flash, the, the, the entities that appear, their entire program is a program of language acquisition. And, you know, this is a point that's brushed over in science fiction films because it's actually such a conundrum. Those of you who saw and uh, you suffered, as I did, uh, Mars Attacks, uh, the, the, the little role for Rod Steiger in there as the German guy with the translation machine. Well, if you think about alien contact, real alien contact, we cannot assume that universal understanding is easily achieved. The very first aspect of true alien contact would probably be a language lesson of some sort, because the aliens don't want to communicate about our gross national product or our political system. If they do, they're not really aliens. They're just odd-looking people from far away. Uh, <laughs> real aliens have something really alien to communicate, and it can only be communicated in an alien language. So I think it's very suggestive that these invisible entities that we contact when we dissolve the local language boundaries. And they are. They're like mud walls built around our little huts 
collect of mental, you know, our collection of goats and stuff that we've pushed together. And then we dissolve the walls and, you know, there's alien people, there's alien minds out there waiting to trade with us. They probably have always been trading with individual geniuses through dream, through insight, through imagination. I mean, many of, you know, if you've read Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions, you know that even in as constipated and self-conscious an enterprise as science, the real breakthroughs occur in situations of delirium, frenzy, drunkenness, inspiration, and then guys, usually it's guys, spend the whole rest of their professional life trying to make it all sound reasonable and rational and how it proceeded from earlier work done by other people and so forth and so on. Uh, th this is just a, a fantasy, a, a kind of way of attaining respectability. Well, yeah, I mean, Hinduism and uh, Hebrew and... I think those are the two biggies, have really elaborate theories of the power and the tra and the, the place in the universal scheme of things of certain tones. And, and, and it's a, as I was sitting, I was thinking Sufi, and then I was also thinking Pythagorean. I mean, some people call this the Pythagorean impulse, the belief that basically the universe is harmonious and exists as a series of octaves, and that if you know the mechanics of this, you can converse with angels, you can ascend to higher levels. Uh, yes, again, it's an issue of language. I mean, some languages fill your pockets with lead, and some languages, you know, give you a helium balloon plunging into these metaphysical areas. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about this morning, and maybe this is the place to get into it, is we've spoken of the imagination as a, a seemingly boundless realm, but it's not ruleless. It, and if people who, who encounter it without rules often have very difficult experiences, the most difficult of which can be raving madness, I would think. And so if we're going to embrace the imagination as the new benchmark of, uh, of being, then we need to talk about what, what the rules are that obtain in the imagination. You know, the 14th century nominalist William of Ockham dealt with questions like, uh, can God do anything? Yes, God can do anything. Then can God make a rock so heavy that God can't pick it up? And then if not, why not? And, and what does this mean? Well, this is an effort to tame the imagination. And Occam concluded from exercises like that that even God must follow the rules of logical necessity, otherwise becoming trapped in self-negating uh, paradox. So I, I am thinking about this. I listed three uh, areas where rules might be gleaned that could be applied to the imagination. Uh, the, the first two are linked somehow. Uh, mathematics. Uh, mathematics is not what you think it is. Mathematics is basically uh, rational thinking about defined sets of entities. And since the imagination is nothing but defined sets of entities. The rules which govern them uh, are worth learning. In practical terms, what this comes down to is uh, logic. 
And one of the problems that I think haunts the current cultural impasse is the fact that there is a lot of hostility to science, and it has spilled over. And science, we should be very suspicious of. It's a it's a wonder worker. It's a magician dealing its wares in the marketplace. So we should be suspicious of science. But this uh, scientistic paranoia has spilled over into a, a suspicion of reason. This is too much. If you abandon reason, you will have nothing to guide you but the emotional depth of the situation. This is what Heidegger called the depth of the call. And in the 20th century, the history of following uh, the depth of the call has not been a happy one. We cannot trust the call of the blood uncritiqued by reason. Uh, reason is primary in this situation. Well, so then many people say, well, mathematics is impossible, logic is difficult. Isn't there a third possibility? Isn't there yet another way to get a handle on this? And the answer is yes, but I'm not sure it's easier. It may seem at first easier, but that is uh, aesthetics. The imagination uh, must serve the ideal of the beautiful. This is I talked about this a little bit. Uh, last night, uh, the, the, uh, that which is tasteless is to be avoided at all costs. And 90% of the difficulty in your intellectual life would never have happened if you had just had better taste. <laughs> Am I not right? You know? Uh, uh, I, I look at this Heaven's Gate thing in amazement because of its tastelessness. That's all. I mean, uh, it, it is utterly unappealing for that reason. I don't even have to reach for the club of logic. Uh, if it had been better scripted, uh, I might need logic. But the aesthetics of the situation are just so overwhelmingly, ugh. <laughs> that <laughs> the suicide cult that uh, eliminated uh, itself in San Diego. Yeah. I'm gonna get up to well, usually, I mean, usually people ask me what will happen in 2012, and I say. It's like asking a man facing east at 2 a.m., what will sunrise look like? In other words, it's too early right. to ask. I mean, in terms of technology... Well, I think that, uh, A, I don't have an answer to the problem of the bully and the slave, unless, as the Marxists claim, that is inimical to disparity of wealth. Because I think disparity of wealth is a transient phenomenon uh, based on a limited technology. But it is entirely possible that we can make everyone a king and we will still have bullies and uh, slaves. So if the Marxists are wrong and the addressing of the economic disparity doesn't change the structure of the human soul, then... Uh, we will have to go deeper. And I don't know how this is going to look. There's a lot of tension in any community that discusses this kind of stuff over what, where the body lies in all of this. Can we solve our problems and maintain our individual existences? Or are we about to are we in fact furiously building a, a level of hierarchical control above the level of the individual that, that will make things like states and corporations seem like pale soup indeed? Are we in fact trying to create a super organism? What is the relationship of an idea like that to classic fascism? Uh, 
Well, what about the Internet? You mean, is it the coming of the superorganism? It is prosthesis on an incredible scale. It is going to define, to redefine what it is to be human. I, I think technologies are neither gods nor demons. It's what you do with it. But the dilemma of human freedom is that we don't know we don't know where we rest in the universal hierarchy of uh, good and evil. In other words, what would we do if we could do anything? Would our transcendent impulses drive us to a kind of angelhood? Or, as James Joyce says, would we flop on the sceny side? And, and the answer normally given is some would do one and some the other. Yes, but what if we erase that possibility of individual action and is there then only one destiny? And then what shall it be and who shall uh, decide? Uh, I would be fairly pessimistic if I saw this all going on on a level playing field. But it isn't going on on a level playing field. Uh, transcendence is favored. Nature is, seems to be in the business of building systems which transcend themselves. We can see that as far back in time as we care to look and throughout all of nature. So it seems like we actually have a, a hell of a tailwind helping us toward the transcendent other. Probably that is what will make the difference. We couldn't have done it by ourselves, but we happen to be in a universe which is itself involved in the process of bootstrapping to higher levels. Yeah. Well, it traditionally, meaning since the invention of print, the artist has had this role where the eccentricity and the bohemian lifestyle and so forth of the artist was tolerated because the argument was the artist is a kind of antenna for this mysterious thing called the future. And, uh, and the artist would sound the alarm and bring the news. In a sense, we don't hear this kind of talk anymore because this is the future. You know, we have become the very thing our parents warned us against. Uh, we, we, those cheerful dreams of endless progressivism that built up the 19th century and early 20th century have given way to a much more cynical and sophisticated understanding that uh, we may, our buildings may become taller, our automobiles shinier, but somehow the, the human animal is not moving forward uh, at the same rate as our technology. Uh, so what we have to do then is give people opportunities and let the devil take the hindmost. Uh, at least create a world where those who aspire to transcendence are not blocked in the aspiration. And of course, it's not, it's not that some of us are these pure aspirants and others the haunters of the sleazy side of the internet. We each play all these roles and move in between them according to taste and mood. I mean, one of the great falsities of print is, is the making illegitimate of schizophrenia. I mean, we are all just swarms of personalities. The idea that a healthy person has a, a unified identity is just a silly idea. It's like believing that sexual preference comes in only two flavors or something. It's one of those incredibly weird simplifications that once made, everybody lines up and salutes, no matter how much agony it causes the individual. Yeah. Well, last night what I said was that I was a Platonist, 
and that Plato felt that the that the world was approached through three paths: the good, the true, and the beautiful. But that goodness is controversial, and truth difficult to discern. But that beauty has a kind of resonant self-evidence, and so following beauty, it's my faith, will lead to the good and the true. And some beauty is, I mean, I'm a fan of extreme forms of beauty. Uh, Hieronymus Bosch and uh, Redon and James Ensor. I mean, the beautiful can be grotesque. Of course, this then opens up a, a whole aesthetic can of worms that maybe we don't want to get into. Uh, uh, well, beautiful art is never bad. Yes, I think grotesque, the beauty of the grotesque is the unique modern contribution to the discussion of beauty. Uh, we, and, and it's a higher form of perception. I mean, it's all very fine to find beauty in wild flowers and women dancing in diaphanous dresses and harpsichord music. And it's quite another to find beauty in ripped up railway tickets and found objects and smashed machinery and, and that sort of thing. The modern sensibility has been unsentimental and has, in that sense, I think, advanced the canon of beauty. Modernity, I'm feeling much better about now that it's over. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's such a huge enterprise to look back on. You know, I mean, uh, uh, what faith, what simplicity, what uh, naivete those people possessed. Uh, I, I can hardly get over it. The 20th century, for all of its brutality and its, uh, its uh, flirtation with the, the dark side of the human soul, the counterpoint to that was its incredible optimism and idealism and, it, and simplicity. I mean, the simplicity of fascism, the simplicity of Marxism, the simplicity of democratic political theory. I mean, these are ide ideologies that clearly never met a human being. <laughs> yeah. Is there any way to Well, the idea of an attractor, uh, this, you see, these huge thought structures that we live inside that we're not even aware of. And, and one of them is, is the idea that uh, uh, causes precede their effect. We, this seems like a non-statement to most people. Of course, causes precede effect. But in fact, uh, processes, if causes always preceded effects, then many, many processes would be in unpredictable that are in fact predictable. And this has to do with this word we introduced last night briefly, the creode, the runnel, a given process, the destiny of a people or the evolution of a political system or the growth of a series of interconnected scientific ideas is not in fact free to develop in any direction it wants. It is going on in an epigenetic environment of, of intellectual confinement of some sort. And in the same way that water runs downhill, a given idea developing in a given time and place will predictably develop in a certain direction. Uh, one of the very large creodes that we can see at work in nature and society is what I call uh, the conquest of dimensionality. Uh, biology is a strategy for 
moving into and occupying ever more dimensions. And biology begins as a point-like chemical replicating system attached to a primordial clay in a the proverbial warm pond somewhere at the dawn of time. And as life develops, it folds itself. It becomes a three-dimensional object. It replicates itself in time. By that means, it claims the temporal dimension. After a two or three billion years of that, it, it has evolved itself to the point where, with strong muscles, it can move through space. With superb visual organs, it can coordinate its exterior environment. And finally, through the advent of language, it can tell its story, it can move information around not present, and as soon as you begin to code that information into stone or magnetic medium or whatever, in a sense, time has stopped. You are moving outward now, and uh, this very large creode seems to uh, inform not only biology, but the human enterprise as well. So when I talk about stuff like the evolution of photolithography and moving pictures out of photography and the evolution of surround sound and the global airline system and these kinds of things, these are dimension-conquering phenomena designed to shrink the Earth to a point. And of course, the Internet is the mother of all dimensional conquest. I mean, in a single 40-minute session on the internet, I may talk to computers in Helsinki, Australia, Paris, Vanuatu, you name it. And I don't even notice that this is happening. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's meaningless to think in those terms because, in fact, you might as well think of it all being inside your CPU sitting on your desk. It has the same uh, effect. And, and what that is, is it's the sum total of human knowledge being daily augmented. And the fury with which people put their thing on the Internet, everything from you know, how grandma's recovering from her stroke to uh, I visited a language site the other night that had uh, 122 syllabuses for 122 languages that were philological engines for searching these languages. I got there through the Vonich manuscript site. Yes, that all still goes on. Uh, that community is at work. So apparently we will not rest until all space and all time is brought down into, for all practical purposes, a single point. And this is an idea that has been around in various forms since at least the 16th century. I mean, it's the alchemical idea of the philosopher's stone, a universal panacea, a medicine which makes you wise, immortal, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-good, uh, but interestingly conceived as an artifact of technology, conceived as something brought into being through the effort of a, a technological worker in concert, in resonance uh, with the intention of nature, which is to do the same thing. The human world is simply a catalyst for nature's intention. We are speeding up nature's program of dimensional transcendence. It means